So he just looked me straight in the eye and said, I dare you to kiss me. I looked him in the eye and I said, F you, fine. And I did. And I kissed him right in that orange streetlight, <laughs> illuminated for the block to see. I kissed him. And it was that moment where I just realized, oh, this is a thing. Hello, I am Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. Michael Dumlau is an artist, activist, and the author of The Wisdom of Gunkles, a new book that celebrates the role of gay uncles and highlights the diverse perspectives and lived experiences they have to offer their families. Born in the Philippines, he spent his childhood in Sydney and then California before moving to Washington, D.C. in his early 20s. It was here that he made his home, found his chosen family, and laid down roots. We caught up to talk about his early days in the city, going to the lost superclub Velvet Nation, getting hand jobs at phone parties, and uh, dating Republicans. I moved to the other side of the country, and in many ways the other side of the world, to save my relationship with my family. Oh. Because having come out to my family um, and, you know, navigating that perilous dynamic of being, you know, brown immigrants, you know, twice immigrated brown immigrants, no less, um, who had in many ways been in survival mode for a really long time, um, also growing up in a very religious Christian household. And yes, family was very important to me. Faith um, was, and in, in some way also continues to be very important to me. But my coming out um, basically disrupted all of that. And it forced me to do what my parents taught us to do. And that was, you know, sometimes the best way to find out who you are, to recover all of your relationships with people is to frankly, you know, go across the world and, and explore and, and, and depart. You know, sometimes that dislocation from those relationships is basically what repairs it. Um, because when I came out, there was a lot of pressure to keep it quiet. There was a lot of pressure to conform. There was a lot of pressure. Uh, at some point, actually, when I did come out, we, we, uh, we got kicked out of the church that we were in. Um, and that formed a lot of um, stress. Yes, absolutely. And very, very religious family. Uh, we were also very big on the music ministry. And when I had come out of the closet, this was in Santa Barbara. Um, this was after, I mean, close to 10 years at this point of my parents leading music across ministries from the Philippines to Australia to America. And that ended the moment I came out. We were literally kicked out <laughs> of the pulpit, kicked out of the church, um, and I, for me, I think part of it was to help my parents save, I, I don't know if it was save face or at least recover from that trauma, but also for me to remove myself so that I could frankly create the kind of safe space that I needed, um, mm. you know, to, to become who I am, to discover who I am, apart from all of the hurt and the pain that I felt that I was causing them at the time. Yeah. So can I, so I'm going to, just going to ask questions about sure. them and then about you. Absolutely. So with, with them and their response, was it, they were more worried about how other people would react? Yeah. Or? Um, you know, it, I think it's, I, I, I have grown to forgive them and I have grown to understand them, you know, acknowledging that any immigrant, especially, you know, immigrant from, immigrants from, uh, war-torn countries, from conflict-ridden areas, um, from cultures that are not just conservative, but also very resource-restricted, right? Um, when we come to a place like America, we are forced to find our tribes out of pure survival. And truth be known, the Filipino community, the family that was there, they helped us survive. I mean, we spent the first year in a single-family home, all five of us, myself, my two brothers, my mom and my dad, in, mm -hmm. a, in a single bedroom in my 
uh, mother's sister's three bedroom house in Santa Barbara. And she herself, her sister, had a husband and three kids. So it was a family of 10. So basically, basically, two families of five plus our grandmother, <laughs> all living in this tiny home, just, you know, surviving and, and, and eventually thriving. But all of that basically, we had a very, very sort of close knit family. And then, and then around us was this other community of family members and other Filipino communities. Mm. And that became just a part of how we survived. It's how we uh, created um, livelihoods. It's how we found a home. It's how we were able to survive the incredibly, like, just toxic, uh, you know, sort of racism that was happening around us as well. And that was, it was explicit and implicit. It was systemic, certainly. Um, and so it was, it was that sort of like, you know, that phenomenon of having to find your community, your tribe, your village, just out of protection. And so for my family, I think it was important to keep those uh, protections alive. And there was always a concern mm. that any disruption to that would render them vulnerable. At the same time, there was also reputational issues at stake. Um, my parents at the time had also become the leaders in the community. Um, there was also that issue with faith and with church and maybe wanting to recover some of that, you know, some of the shame of being forced out of the church. Um, so my parents, I'll just put it this way, when I came out of the closet, there was shock, right? Absolutely, there was shock, there were tears. There was a moment of telenovela style drama in an evening of of crying and shouting and and objects flown, right? Like like it it was it was um, very classic sort of in that way. Um, but in the middle of the night after coming out, I woke up um, in the arms of my father, cradling me, saying that you know, saying I love you, I love you, you're my son, you're my son, you're oh, my wow. son, and he kept saying it over and over again. And I liken it to a mantra, almost like a prayer, like a protection spell around me and also maybe a protection spell around the family because he knew what was going to come afterwards. And truth be told, not everyone in the community received it well. They were shunned. They were turned away. They lost friends. They lost stature, right? But then I think they also started to discover who their true family, who their true friends, who their true community was. And I think, but it took them a journey to do that. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so while, yes, they were accepting within the family, within the community, you know, they, I think there was the protection there. Because remember, I also had two younger brothers. I had other brothers, other siblings that they needed to care for as well. And they needed to make sure that they had the same protective community and opportunities um, within the community as well. And I, at least personally, did not want to endanger that for them. Mm. And so let's talk about you then, because you, mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what the timeline is. I don't know what the <laughs> like the, the point from coming out to being shunned by the community was, but were you like, like, this is it, this, I'm coming out and like, that's it. Or did you kind of keep it on the DL for a while? Um, I mean, you know, like, I think like with most uh, queer people, I knew when I was really young, I knew mm. when I was a very, very young, clearly very effeminate child in the Philippines, um, there is a famous uh, festival, a famous uh, parade, march, uh, festival in the Philippines called Santa Cruzan, which celebrates um, a religious procession. It has the the Christ child. There's a princess. There's a prince. It's kind of Disney. It's like Disney meets the Vatican. Like, And um, I was once picked uh, to be the escort. That's basically the prince to the princess. Um, and in this sort of like Catholic Disney moment, I specifically asked them to dress me in probably like this outfit that in hindsight probably was the first time I was ever in drag. <laughs> I mean, there was a cape. There was a cape. It was silver. It was shiny. Well, I think superheroes I wear capes. It doesn't have to be drag. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. It was our first cosplay. Let's put it that way. It was my very first cosplay as a Catholic Disney prince on a actual like horse drawn cor- um, carriage that brought us to church. And I remember in that moment thinking, um, you know, as I'm sitting next to this girl who I found out later, I was technically sort of betrothed to. I'm like, I'm sorry, girl, this is not going to happen. But um, wait, how old were you? I was five, five or six. Okay. All right. <laughs> and uh, That's perfectly normal, there was this, yeah. Yeah, that was perfectly normal, you know, to be sitting next to a girl that may, I may or may not have been destined to marry one day. Um, and so she was dressed as a princess. I was dressed as a prince. And in that moment, I thought to myself, this is fabulous. And I kept wanting to do it. I kept wanting to dress up. I kept wanting to. And then eventually I found myself like in sort of a kid's theater as an artist in music. And my parents, 
And my mom specifically enrolled me in art classes, music classes, theater classes. I was in an art school. <gasps> Did when I was she seven. not know what that would mean? I, I she wanted to nurture <laughs> the creative energies in her children. <laughs> as soon as you let your kids be creative, duh, homosexuality. I know, I know exactly. And and on top of that, my mom was a singer. Um, you know, she was she worked in the bank. You know, she was corporate, but she was also an aspiring singer. My dad was a trade attaché, but also was an actor. So they, I think, saw in their kids like these latent talents that they had always wanted to nurture in themselves so they nurtured in us and they also recalled that each of their parents told them that they couldn't pursue their creative dreams because uh, they needed to have practical jobs sensible. so it was those yeah. classic sort of reversals of like oh my kid's going to be there so I became you know a designer eventually now an author my middle brother's a filmmaker my youngest brother's a musician so you know it works so kudos to my Philippine parents for not sort of subscribing to that stereotype or that pressure of like only demanding they have doctors lawyers and engineers um, so, you know, my mom has always acknowledged that I was born out of her holding a karaoke mic. So she, between the costumes and the fact that she forced her kids to basically sing back up to her singing, like literally, like we were, she basically created a, ch- she didn't have children, she had backup singers. So, ah, so, so basically what you're saying is she made you gay. I mean, she created a partridge family dynamic, which inevitably <laughs> meant that one of us was going to come out homosexual. <laughs> um, and, that, and, and we did that in the church, right? So we were sort of like this like Filipino partridge family of worship music. Uh, where And throughout all of that, in that space of performance, ironically, that's when I started realizing that not only was I different, not only was I effeminate, not only was I creatively inclined, but I also started to like boys. And so transferred then to Sydney, we would you know, flee to Sydney, um, you know, when I was seven or eight. And I don't know much, how much you know about Australian culture, but it is very, very masculine, dare I say toxically masculine in a lot of ways. It's very sports oriented. Uh, certainly at the time, not very welcoming of brown people coming in, <laughs> escaping political turmoil from Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. Um, and so it was difficult, right? Because not only was I navigating racism for the first time in my life, I was also navigating the fact that I kind of like boys. Because I think about growing up in a very sports-centric culture like Australia, it meant that I was constantly surrounded by like boys in speedos, locker rooms, changing <laughs> rooms. And, you know, is that sort of like, you know, blokey, matey, like slap in the ass, like slap a dick here, there. Like it was very homoerotic, but homophobic. It was homophobic homoeroticism, like replete throughout my entire, you know, young adolescence, um, which also just made me that much more self-conscious about like, oh, this is only good if I don't find this sexually erotic <laughs> and attractive. <laughs> it's only good if I'm actually physically trying to hurt someone. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, why not both? Yeah, why not both? Um, and then, um, you know, I was also in the midst of the church. So I said, okay, this is an affront to God. I'm going to go to hell. I embodied all of that. And then move later to when we finally did move to the United States, move to Santa Barbara, California. By then I was 12. Uh, And by then, you know, the cat had been out the bag. I mean, I knew, I knew what was happening inside. I just didn't know if I could ever actualize it. Um, Mm -hmm. And at some point I remember saying to myself that to help my family survive in this strange new place, because my family, not only did we give up living in, uh, in Australia, left jobs, left schools, left a network, left family. We gave up a lot of stuff, a lot of opportunities as well. And we came to uh, America literally with a dream, literally with everything we could fit in our bags. Like for the second time, it felt like we were fleeing again. Mm. Um, But it also meant that we were in survival mode again. And so I decided to put myself away. And by that, I mean, I decided to just be the big brother. I decided to be the one that was going to be the perfect golden child that was going to get the you know the best grades and it was going to help the house uh, take care of my younger brothers. I even got a job, um, you know, to help pay the bills. And all of that was just to make sure that you know we didn't add to the statistics of a failed immigrant family, right? That was going to disappoint everyone. And so I didn't really come to terms with who I was until you know eventually hormones took over and I found myself falling in love with a boy in high school in the theater program once again. And this was around the time of that stupid Romeo and Juliet movie. And he happened to look like Leonardo DiCaprio. If he's listening to this, he's going to get such an ego boost. But <laughs> did, he, did he have the fringe? Is that... He had the fringe. He had the freckles, <laughs> the smile. He also happened to be an actor on the stage. He was sort of like the celebrated teen actor of our like community theatre. 
<laughs> um, so cliche to fall in love with him. Oh, so cliche to fall in love with him. And he was a bad boy as well. He was a bad yeah. white boy. <laughs> bad oh, white boy actor. Man. Like all the oh, things that my man. parents told me I was not, I was just <laughs> away from. And then, you know, we were in marching band together. We were in um, theater class together. We were doing choir together. And he started wait, showing Wait, 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 wait. You were, you were in marching band, theater and choir and you still had to come out. Yes, yes. That is the crazy thing. <laughs> this is back in the day when that wasn't an automatic. Okay, oh, granted. I mean, come on. Come on, the 90s, come on. <laughs> but to that point, okay, so to that point, it was a safer cultural environment because at the time we had Clueless, we had two <laughs> seasons of The Real World, and... <laughs> And, uh, and 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 then between the two scenes of the real world, all with like gay characters. Oh, right? the so first we should gay just characters say, reality. I don't think yeah, like sorry. the real world is just an American thing, right? Like it's kind of like Big Brother, but it's not Big oh, Brother. Oh yes, yes, yes. I would say it was yeah. a precursor to Big Brother, right? So it was a big thing at MTV, and they stuck basically like twelve annoyingly attractive people, you know, strangers in their house, and they were forced to live with each other and be real with each other. And the very first one in New York had one of the very first, like, LGBT characters, and then every single one has had sort of a gay character. And it was, and it was very revolutionary at the time, especially for a young, um, you know, queer kid of mm. colour like me to see not only people of colour, immigrants, you know, be represented, but then also the first gay people to be represented. Um, and so that was the thing. And then if you remember Clueless, the movie with Alicia Silverstone, you know, not only did she introduce us to the power of yellow plaid, uh, but she also introduced us to the first gay best friend boyfriend. Oh, is there? <laughs> Oh, yes. I need to watch that film. I didn't Absolutely. Know. It was iconic. Like she had the classic trope of falling in love with a beautiful, perfect Disney prince of a, of a boy and tries to sleep with him and then discovers that he's gay. I thought she fell in love with her brother. Eventually, after the gay guy s- oh, snubbed okay. her. I mean, that's the obvious second choice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, obvious second choice, right? It's like go from like gay best friend to your stepbrother. At least you're not blood related. <laughs> um, and so all of that basically meant that when I did finally come out, and I did come out. So the, the the story of the coming out is basically at some point he and I got close. He and I started, you know, not not we hadn't snogged yet. Like we had, <gasps> but like had you like brushed your knees against each other and like? Yes, oh. there was a lot of there was a lot of like you know very very sort of like you know Jane Austen ish sort of like Aww. winking at each other. A lot of like brushed hands, very sort of like you know like wind through the reed sort of like crap. And then at some point there was a moment where we were standing, we were sitting outside of my parents' home. It was like pitch black midnight, and there was an orange fluorescent streetlight just out, just off to the side of my parents' driveway. And he sat me down and he looked at me and said, where is this going? What are we? And he and I was like, we're best <laughs> friends. We're friends. We're just friends. We're great friends. I really like hanging out with you. Because ironically, he was also the very first male best friend I'd ever had in my entire life. Uh, which ironically made my parents really happy that I finally had a good male influence in my life. Because at the point, <laughs> at that time, all of my friends were women. <laughs> we're all girls. And so, um, so he just looked me straight in the eye and said, I dare you to kiss me. I looked him in the eye and I said, F you, fine. And I did. And I kissed him right in that orange street light, <laughs> illuminated for the block to see. I kissed him. And it was that moment where I just realized, oh, this is a thing. And then we decided, and then we just continued and we just kept snogging <laughs> basically and pushing like the, the entire time. And it was, it was very passionate, very teenage, very, you know, like, of course, like when I replayed in my head, it like took like four 40 days and 40 nights, but it was probably all of like a minute. Um, uh, I don't want to get too crass either, but I will say that later in the get evening- Get crass, I'm fine, I'm fine. Okay, fine. So like immediately afterwards, I said, listen, if I'm going to fucking do this, we're going to fucking do this. And so I grabbed the keys from my parents. Oh my God, they're going to hear this. Okay, I grabbed the keys from my mom's, um, not her purse, but next to her purse, right? We went into the family Dodge Caravan and I may or may not have had my first sexual experience in the family Dodge Caravan. <laughs> In the driveway. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Which my parents then, several hours later, took us to oh, school in. So, we, so what? Was it just like, oh, you know, I've been waiting for this moment forever. I'm going to make this, like, count. I think sort of, yeah. I mean, like, I had been basically, I'm just going to use this word because I can't think of another word to say this, but I had been edging. <laughs> like, 
Should I explain that to you, listeners, what that is? But, like, but do you, you mean physically edging? <laughs> yeah, kind of. But I mean, like, no, but I'm so like emotionally, spiritually, but also physically. Like, I hadn't had like a, a like a sexual sort of moment. I mean, I'd had sexual moments with girls prior. And I had like one really random camp experience with like a distant male cousin that didn't count. It's on the record, everyone. It doesn't count. Yeah, it is on the record. Yeah, it's years and years prior. And he knows who I'm talking about too. Um, but it was until that night that I not only have my first like passionate, like French kiss, you know, with emotion, with feeling, you know, with a boy. He then like, you know, took me in his arms and we did not quite everything, but pretty close to everything that a young teenage person with, you know, access to shitty 90s internet could muster in terms of what gay sex was. Um, and so, <laughs> which is basically just a lot of horror and end jobs. But still, that was a can huge we just, moment can for we me. Just si- can we just side note for a minute? Yeah. One of my big pet peeves about movies and TV shows is when people just spontaneously have sex and they don't like shower or get ready in any way. Yeah, I know. It's horrible. It's incredibly <laughs> unrealistic. <laughs> so I'm just, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I don't know why I felt the need to bring that up. I just was thinking about you in that camper van. And I just want to reassure your mom, if she is listening, <laughs> that it was probably like really innocent. It was very, very innocent. And we did clean up afterwards. <laughs> I had to remove all the traces of evidence. Come on. Um, it was the first time that I thought like, and it was a bridge that I had needed to cross, both physically, emotionally, spiritually, vehicularly. <laughs> so you just can't see a dodge now without getting misty-eyed. Um, I, so I will say it- that for a long time, I did may or may not have had a kink about having sex in cars afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so just something about the vibrations of the motor. Uh, but so from going from this moment to, mm. to coming out to your parents, like what what kind of time frame was that? And kind of yeah, and so process? then we sta- so here's the thing. So then we started dating. We started officially dating. So that was the moment... Oh, Post-quitally. the teenage experience is supposed to be your first sexual experience and then never talk to that person <laughs> again. Yeah, no, From no, shame. this is, I know, I am, I, I know I'm ashamed. Like I, I, no, this is very much a classic sort of like 50s, like teenage rom-com sort of moment where we were best friends and then, you know, we had sex and then we became boyfriends. I think that's how that works, right? That timeline. And then we announced it. So that was the big thing was like, then we sort of like, told close friends. But here's the thing. Um, Don't expect your secret to be a secret if your best friends that you tell are in (laughs) theatre. Because those (laughs) assholes love nothing more than drama. And what is more dramatic than the high school's first ever gay couple? (laughs) And, And so it became a thing. I actually, not only did we come out to our friends, very, very soon after we were forced to come out. And it wasn't, we weren't, I will never say this. I, we were not outed. We were definitely not outed. People were very much like, am I allowed to tell? Am I not allowed to tell? And after I said yes to this and this and that, at some point I just said, fuck it, I'm just going to tell everyone. And so I did. I told people. And I did, like, I did like the strategic thing, right? I told like all of like the gossipy girls. Like I, I told the popular girls. By this point, by the way, to go back to Clueless, which I now feel like I'm totally endorsing this movie, <laughs> like inadvertently. <laughs> but what Clueless also did was it protected me. And I'll tell you why. Because Clueless showed every single popular girl in America and anyone who showed that, that everyone needed the best accessory of the season, which was the gay best friend. And so what is the best defense against a homophobic, insecure male jock? Their girlfriends who suddenly had a had to protect me like they were protecting their Louis Vuitton bags. Oh. I, I'm not even kidding. I was literally everyone's favorite fashion accessory at that point. So it was great because I got stature, like weird fetishized stature for the first time in my life. Um, and I also had a boyfriend. And in many ways, in the school, we were being celebrated. So one thing to bear in mind is like in school, we were celebrated. I had a couple of stupid homophobic moments from some stupid Mormons here and there. But other than that, we were mostly safe and celebrated. Which then re- meant to me that at some point it was going to get to my parents. And so I was ge- ginning up, getting up, gearing up, gearing up, gearing up to this moment. And then it happened very, very unexpectedly after a party. So by this point, because we were dating, I was lying a lot, frankly, lying more than a teenager usually would, telling my parents, oh, I need to borrow the car to go to Bible study. There was a lot of Bible study going on. And then I, to that point, said, oh, mom, I need the car. I'm going to youth group Bible study. Uh, and then I took my boyfriend to a party out in the mountains where 
there was no Bibles and there was no studying. And I come back, it was light, and my mom said, hey, I checked with the pastor, there was no Bible study tonight. Where did you go? Who did you go? Who are you with? And she started grilling me. And at some point she said, is it the drugs? I know by it though, like, you know, she started, she, she went full on just Filipino mother at that point. Um, and then I reminded myself that I actually do know my native tongue and started arguing back. And then after like a very, you know, very, very argumentative back and forth, she says, I don't know who you are anymore. You're taking my car every day. I don't know where you're going. I don't feel like I know who you are. Who are you? Who is this person in front of me? And that's when I said, well, you're right. You don't know who I am. You don't even know the fact that I'm gay. Like I, I said to the point basically, like, you don't know who I am. I'm gay. So that's, that's when the theater kid jumped out, right? Yeah, the theater kid jumped out. <laughs> and then her theater kid jumped out and without skipping a beat said, well, you still can't borrow my car anymore. <laughs> like, Well, I mean, that is the ultimate punishment, right? It is. She was, yes, it is. It was just like, well, you still can't, you can't borrow my car. And then she took it and she was like, but what <laughs> did she say? And then we went back and forth. And, you know, and then that was a moment where she had a struggle. She was like, okay, we'll get through this, we'll fix this. She kept saying that we'll fix this, you know, and, you know, but don't worry, you're still my son, you're still my, you're still my son, you know, we'll get through this, we'll figure out a way to fix this. And and I told her, and I didn't have the words back then to have said, you know, there's nothing to fix. All I said was, mom, this is who I am, this this is who I am. And then she says, okay, we'll talk about it in the morning, don't tell your dad yet, he's not ready. And then that's when, two hours later, I wake up in my father's arm and he's cradling me, crying, sobbing on top of me, saying, <sighs> so clearly she had gotten it, you know, she, she had told him before I had a chance to tell him. And she, and he was cradling me, you know, saying, you know, I will, I will always protect you. I was like, you know, because he knew, he knew what was going to come. And at the end of the day, you know, what they were most concerned about wasn't so much them. And, and of course, there was their reputational you know, sort of like, you know, needs there. It was for me. Because also, remember at the time, you know, this is still the 90s, late 90s, yeah, mid yeah. to late 90s, lots of anti-gay laws, lots of anti-gay sentiment. We had literally just finished a very, very anti-gay, homophobic, um, you know, sermon at church like a couple of weeks prior. Um, you know, there was a lot of rhetoric, political rhetoric around basically literally practically calling for like the recriminalization. No, okay, people, essentially. Mm-hmm. So um, it was not very safe. At the same time, though, because of that, there was a lot of activism. And I do remember that same summer, there was a lot of news about young people taking their same-sex partners to prom. There was a very, very famous one in LA. There was a famous one, actually, just a few counties over that got a lot of press in the, a lot of the news stations within, um, within in, in California and eventually America. And then that made me think, well, should I bring my boyfriend to prom? <laughs> And so what happened was they, the prom was coming, prom was coming. My parents were like, don't bring them to prom. We don't need this attention. Like, we need to deal with this as a family. And then something happened. Remember that church I told you about that we got kicked out of when I came out? My boyfriend joined it. Joined it and then dumped me for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, but, I mean, like, okay, so just to work through this, what do you look like in a loincloth? <laughs> Uh, I look now pretty good because I've been working out. Uh, but back then, I looked like basically a a, star, a starving Filipino teenager, you know, like in a loincloth. It would not have been cute. I, like, I would have looked like a server at some sort of like really racist restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> but like, okay, so sorry to make light of it. But like, was it influence from his family? Was it, did he go to one of those weird <sighs> carnival things that they have in America where they, like it's a haunted house, but it's about people dying of AIDS? Um, so, those things did not happen around us, thank goodness. Oh, okay. um, but what had ha- what also happened was I had told him why it was such a big step for me to do this. And then when I told him that I had, you know, basically been kicked out of the music ministry and my parents also kicked out, I guess he had sort of developed a guilt. Like he felt that he had inadvertently taken me away and my family away from our support network. Um, and so he went there. And then unbeknownst to me, but he himself had been struggling with his faith for a really, really long time as well. And then just something clicked, something happened in the midst of all this, where a combination of his guilt, his long-term sort of like struggling with his own faith that I didn't know about, sort of just made him that much more attractive to the to the conversion therapists and the conversion ministers in that church that I actually was being forced into as well. But my family, to their credit, said that I was not to go to. He, however, went and got stuck. 
And but so, like what, conversion minister. So that's like converting you from homosexual to heterosexual, not converting yes, you from absolutely. a non-believer to a believer. No, uh, no, no. That was converting me sexually. So converting, and it's not necessarily converting us to straight, so much as making us sort of deny our homosexuality, um, and and turning us at least not necessarily straight, but turning us you know, biblically aligned in that we would deny our sexual sort of desires, wow, our sinful wow. desires, and instead go on the path of, of righteousness. And so I always tell people, it's like, yes, I lost my very first boyfriend to Jesus. Um, he dumped me, literally dumped me a week before saying that he was doing it to save my soul and that he needed to save his soul. And he had to go through this journey. And so I couldn't bring my first boyfriend to prom. So in many ways, it was a combination of that trauma Plus the fact that my parents were also now dealing with now having an out gay Filipino son. And I was actually told later that I was the very, very first out gay Filipino in that community ever. So the entire community didn't know what to do. My family didn't know what to do. I, To my knowledge, um, you know, particularly at that point, I was the first gay out member on both sides of my family. So this was mm. a disruption on multiple levels. I needed to get mm. away because at that point I was now starting to... I had that moment, right, that moment of like, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this because I need to live my truth. And I started seeing myself creep back into that protective older brother, young, you know, oldest child uh, sort of like narrative and, and behavior and pattern of needing to protect others before I protected myself. Um, and so then I started to retreat and thought to myself, oh, wait, do I, should I regret, should, should I say that I regret this? Should I go back to the closet? Should I do? And I, and I guess all of that basically put a very, very strong inkling in my mind that for me to protect my relationship with my family, to protect my parents, to protect my brothers, um, and ultimately I think to protect myself, I needed to leave. And yeah. that's when I decided to move out of the house. Um, and then eventually I actually ended up going back to Australia for college where I would say a combination of moving out of the house in Santa Barbara, started to discover places like LA and West Hollywood finally, all those places that I saw in MemTV's real world, and then getting an opportunity to do part of my university studies back in Australia, where I literally really lived my full gay queer self, apart from even the family that I had grown up with there, and then eventually moving myself to DC. I mean, that was... There, there's very much a narrative of, of voyage, of, of disruption leading to, to departure. Let's just put it that way. And that for me to basically discover who I am, I needed to depart and create something new and find something new. And then from that space of, you know, of incremental healing, only then could I go back and heal the relationships that I had left behind. Mm. So then why DC? So I got a job working for the <laughs> Al Gore campaign, basically, uh, and the entire Democratic National Committee, um, you know, at the time, uh, I, and, and this is basically part of the choices too. Like I had a choice when I was looking for a place, like I need to get out of here, I need to get out of here. Um, I could either move to LA or I could move really, really far away. And I guess in my mind, I, because the very first real, this always goes back to real world, the very first real world was in New York City. And in my head, the very first, like, truly out gay narrative like I ever really saw were all those stories about New York City. And I always thought of New York City as sort of like a place that I would go to. Um, mm -hmm. And so I had this opportunity to help be part of a, um, an election campaign, a political campaign um, in the New York City area. And I applied, I got in, and I found myself driving cross country where I would ultimately help in this, you know, coordinated campaign between some local candidates eventually, um, you know, working on some senatorial candidates, including one Hillary Clinton, and then eventually Al Gore. And all of this basically meant was that that was the year that I not only completely removed myself from my family and from that part of my community and my history, but basically started a whole new history for myself now on the East Coast of America, now by myself. I didn't have any family around me. I was by myself the entire time. I found myself basically in New York City, doing the New York thing, and then eventually going to D.C., if, and I don't know if how many of y'all remember your American political history, not that any of you should, but that was a highly contested election in the 2000s where um, it, it was a toss-up, basically, and eventually came down to a Supreme Court decision. Um, it was the very first time that a hung chad fucked me over. And, then, and, that was and the hung chad being basically a reference to something to do with, like, the voting systems. Like, there was something wrong with, like, a physical paper voting system. And... 
all of that basically meant was that um, many of my candidates, including the presidential candidate, lost. And I found myself basically stuck on the East Coast, eventually stuck in D.C., waiting for the outcome um, the, of a presidential election that had promises of jobs in a career should the outcome go my way. So fortunately, uh, even though, you know, most of my candidates, I mean, actually several of my candidates did win, but the, the big ones uh, didn't quite win. I mean, Hillary obviously won. Um, it did at least give me a solid sort of like political and, and, and professional network in D.C. enough that I was able to find a job immediately. I was able to actually find housing immediately and a small sort of like social network, uh, you know, based off of sort of the political connections I had, which included um, several LGBTQ people, because I was also part of the LGBTQ political action group that was helping us basically, you know, rally LGBTQ people around these candidates. And many of them um, had been to DC and were living in DC. And so I was able to go to, you know, share a house with them. I was able to explore the city with them. And that is how I finally found myself in Velvet Nation. Oh, bringing us around. It only took us 45 minutes to get there. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but like, so was it your plan then to, to like settle in Washington or is it just kind of something like, I'll see what happens? Um, so actually, so the original plan, so remember I started my career in the, new, like the northern New Jersey suburbs and sort of like New York City, Manhattan area. And so the plan was to actually go to D.C., frankly, just survive again. I was definitely back in survival mentality again. It was just like, get a job, get some money, pay your rent, um, and then find my way back up to New York and actually figure out a way to go back and forth. And actually for a while I did. I did actually find myself eventually in a position where I was actually going back and forth between DC and New York to the point that I almost considered myself, um, you know, bi-metropolitan between DC and New York. Um, <laughs> Does anyone use that term? Do people call themselves bi-metropolitan? No, I just, I literally just created it. <laughs> 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 so then let's go back to those first days in Washington. So like the early thousands, what mm-hmm. was the queer scene like at that time? So uh, it was in turmoil for one thing, because it was the very first time that I would, that would experience what I have now experienced many, many, many times since. And that is what happens to DC and the community in general when there is a presidential transition, when there is a party transition. Because remember, we had just spit finished eight years of uninterrupted democratic rule under the Clintons, and now we're going into the Bush era, right? And this was a very, very different era. So I remember distinctly, and I remember too that the, the Supreme Court decisions didn't happen until I believe like January or something like that. So I had moved to DC in November, December, waiting in this like, sort of professional limbo of like, where am I going to stay? Where am I going to go? Where's my job? What am I going to do for a living? And then eventually, you know, finding out that, you know, our candidate had lost and all this and stuff had happened, found myself a job. But then I also found myself in this community of all these people, like just what the F just happened, right? You know, like we had all these dreams, we had all this, like we were so close, we were, you know, starting to, you know, create all these plans. And then suddenly you found yourself in an environment where people were just very, not fearful yet, because that would come soon. Uh, but they were very sort of concerned about like what their prospects were and not importantly how the culture was going to change, knowing that in many ways um, that president who won ran on certain platforms that were not going to be conducive to a lively queer culture. Let's just put it that way. In fact, mm-hmm. in some cases, it would become highly homophobic. Even the rhetoric in those early, early days of that administration started to point towards being very anti-immigrant, um, very homophobic, and all those things that a person like myself who embodies the kinds of identities I embody does not thrive in, right? Mm-hmm. So the queer scene back then um, was... It was big. It was thriving. But there was, it, was, it was a lot of like, sort of, but it was, sort of had this place of like, oh, what's going to happen? And then I discovered something and I have discovered it since in the many, many times that, that DC, America and the world have been in turmoil is the way that the queer community rallies through creativity to create safe spaces and how we discover these strange renaissances, right, of creative output when we are attacked. And that's what I saw. I saw a city that was redefining itself, a community that was redefining itself. Um, And by that, I mean, you know, networks, um, support groups. um, And as we started to see the homophobia, sort of the the, the homophobic rhetoric start to increase more and more, um, I started to see a lot more sort of action and and the sort of sense of, you know, let's fight against this. Um, But then you also started to see just people 
from you know all these people that had come to DC expecting there to be some sort of like different sort of environment than what they're expecting, trying to create something out of out of uh, uh, something that they did not expect, which I thought which I felt made it a little bit more interesting and certainly much more artistically vibrant because suddenly you were forcing these artists and these creatives, such as myself, to really critically think differently about how our art can make a difference. Mm, and that's what I saw. Mm, mm. And and so is that is it like that in DC that the culture kind of is very, very heavily impacted by the leadership, by presidency? Mm-hmm. I guess, and so I guess that there's like a flux of different party affiliated people coming in when a new administration, because they're coming in for jobs. Yeah, yeah it yeah. affects the culture and it also affects the kind of spaces that they, they want to go into, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I just never thought about it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it back then, you had basically a conservative, a conservative Christian Texan in the White House, which meant that we had a lot of you know, gay Republicans. I remember, actually, I will say this. What defined my experience in the first couple of years of living in D.C. is me being a staunch progressive Democrat navigating the dating scene surrounded by <laughs> Republicans, by gay conservative Republicans <sighs> and understanding that dynamic, right? Isn't it weird as well? Like, because you, you kind of, you don't want to be like too judgmental because of someone's um, political affiliation, but like, how the fuck can you not? Yeah. Absolutely. Especially when there was literally, you know, we were all partying in clubs that were like within the shadow, direct line of sight to, you know, the Capitol Dome, to the White House, you know, to these places where our very human dignity was being debated. <laughs> and here you are supporting those debates, supporting the people sort of propping up those debates and or, or behind those mm. debates. And so, you know, so it did sort of like, but I will say this, it also created a sort of um, empathy um, and understanding. And, and I've, I've, this is where I've, I feel like I've grown a bit in that, you know, just because I, I strive to understand you doesn't mean that I will ever agree with you, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I strove to understand these these people who would eventually become my friends, who would eventually become a boyfriend or two, right? In fact, actually, I had long-term relationships <gasps> with several. Yes, Wait, absolutely. That, are you going on the record to yes, say that? Yes, I absolutely dated <laughs> Republicans, right? <gasps> Listen, there's a dynamic in DC, like where... If you want to get laid in this town, you've got to be two things. A, you've got to be politically, not you don't have to give up your core, but you've got to be a bit politically savvy. You also okay. have to be, you also have to be versed because everyone here is a bottom. So if you want to get like sex, you basically have to learn how to top once or twice. <laughs> well, I'll keep that in mind. But <laughs> like there is a difference between getting laid and having a relationship with someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. But maybe this is where we've lost, you know, that camaraderie, you know, in our political dialogue. Is that you, there used to be a point where we could just fuck away our differences, and apparently now even that's not possible. Oh, I, I just long for those days. Yes, <laughs> just fuck across the aisle. You made a vote across the aisle. Just fuck across oh, the aisle. But then, so just like you would have dates that you just didn't talk about anything. Oh, no, we would talk about it. Oh, no, 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 no. Here's the thing about DC, too, that I love is that we're not shy about professing our political affiliations, beliefs, and alignments, even in the midst of a hookup or, like, to get a hookup or, I don't know, maybe there's a kink. Maybe there's a kink there. (laughs) So what you're telling me is your favorite way to fuck is hate fucking. Uh, I would say debate fucking. (laughs) (laughs) I don't have to hate you to debate you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but just like, you know, 10 minutes of a debate with certain people, like you can be fairly certain that you hate them. But here's what I will say. Here's what I'll say. DC is also very, very widely known to be a very kinky town. And I can tell you in those moments of, um, you know, of, of political sort of like strain and stress during a, uh, a romantic amorous moment, <laughs> ball gags go a long way. <laughs> Changing hearts and minds, yeah. Changing hearts and minds, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, maybe we shouldn't talk about how you've beaten up some Republicans in a sexual way. <laughs> Let's talk about Velvet Nation. <laughs> so, yeah, from so beating up to Velvet Nation. <laughs> so do you remember the first time you went there? Oh, absolutely. 100%. If you remember, I came to DC, like I literally just said, I came to DC in a moment of just just professional limbo, personal limbo. Like, I didn't know what I was doing here. I don't know if I was going to stay. 
um, I didn't know what was going to happen really to myself, to my friends, to... So I was very much, I would say scared, but definitely certainly anxious and apprehensive. But much like my first time hooking up in my parents' caravan, I decided to just go full hog and just say, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it fully to the hilt, like balls deep. And so, yeah, so I was in DC, not really knowing what to do. And remember, but also remember that I was part of the LGBTQ group. And so, and there were a lot of people there who were already sort of like, uh, at least familiar, you know, with the town, had friends here, had network here. And so like any good homosexual, you know, I found my tribe where I could find them. And our very, very first night, the very first night in DC, I went to Velvet Nation with politicos, oh. with other political gays. Because we were there for a conference. We were there for a big sort of like strategy meet because... Um, I came here, actually, it may have been even like the weekend before the actual election day. Um, and so, you know, after like maybe 12, 14 hours of straight political, you know, and, you know, strategizing and grueling work and phone calls and, and, and mailer and last minute mailings, like all these things that we were doing, right? All the activity that goes on in the, in the, the panic. The, yeah. Yeah. The frantic panicking that happens before an election night. I, my friends were like, hey, you want to go for a drink? And I said, sure, where are we going? It's like, oh, this is like this club um, called Velvet Nation. Um, and so we went that evening and my mind was blown away, particularly because I had never been in a space that big. Now, granted, prior to this, I had now gone to gay bars and gay clubs in New York City, in Sydney, in LA, in San Francisco. Those are the four big cities that I'd explored prior to this. And while, you know, those places definitely have big, big clubs, big sort of like thumping. So it was a big sort of, you know, culture um, of, of club culture back then. Um, this is a little bit different, A, because it felt dirtier. It was in it was basically a warehouse, like your classic warehouse club. But it was also sprawling and cavernous. And it had an outdoor sort of uh, seating area, sort of like an outdoor patio and a balcony that I will never forget this, that directly faced a brightly lit Capitol Dome. And for me, oh, that wow. has never, ever, ever not been my image of Velvet Nation throughout all the times I went to Velvet Nation and all the historical moments that would happen in the midst of Velvet Nation, you know, operating was the fact that, you know, at 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning, however, you know, you whatever state of mind or dress you were, like literally you would look up right past the exit and the entrance and you would see the Capitol Dome. And for me, it was sort of that dynamic of power and play that I always found really, really interesting, um, especially in the context of what was to come um, and what would attack and what would happen to the LGBTQ community and to the community at large, like in the years to follow. Um, so I remember that. Like I remember walking outside. I think I think there was like a Junior Vasquez like Madonna remix happening. Um, I think there was like you know a drag queen was like a really really famous drag queen at the time you know was like was 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 on stage and of course there were circuit queens and muscle queens and and that was the thing too about Velvet Nation I remember is that it was everyone was there so like the goth kids were there the raver kids were there the muscle queens were there ah. the twinks were there it was sort of like this communal like watering hole if you will mm. so you talked earlier about the colliding of power and play mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. feel like I know what you're talking about in terms of power but I would like you to talk a bit more about play Phone parties. Oh, <laughs> Let's no. talk about phone oh, party. No. That's horrible. <laughs> Probably the worst invention ever in any sort of like, uh, you know, known to party organizers and event planners ever. Do you um, know what the origin of, I need to look that up. Like, who I don't know what the with origin it? is. But I can only mourn all the lost things, all the things that have been lost in the foam. <laughs> I once, I've only ever been, oh, this is making me sound like the biggest square ever. I've only ever been to one foam party. And then uh, like the next day, my skin like just came out in like massive rash, like everywhere. Oh, of course. It was you so were just disgusting. having a bath with 700 of your other mates. <laughs> it was like the cheapest detergent they used for that foam. It was horrible. Of course, of course. They weren't going to Bed Bath & Beyond or like well, Body Works for like, you know, for a silky lavender scrub to put into the system. No, I yeah, paid £10 like, pounds to get in. I expect the best. No, yeah, yeah. No, they were putting in basically like Dove Dial or like some really crappy <laughs> detergent. Um, but I say foam parties particularly because um, A, they were known for it. Like that was literally what Velvet Nation at the time was known for with these massive, incredibly just dirty and debaucherous 
phone parties how all on the outside. Even, like, how do you even dress for a phone party as well? Like, you've got to, you want to look good going to the club, but then you also want to wear something skanky so it doesn't matter if it gets ruined. Like, how do you make that decision? Uh, except, unless you're, unless you're like a, you know, a fashion diva wannabe like me, I might be <laughs> like, my very first, pa- I will never forget my first phone party because I will also never forget the first time I ever actually mourned an article of clothing. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I had just gone to... Um, okay, first of all, I, I realize I'm about to say the word Armani, but I'm going to follow it with the word exchange. So, but at the time, it felt fancy. All right, at the time, I was barely in my early to like, like I was in my early twenties, barely able to afford rent, but I had, could afford a sparkly new like shirt and like some cute new pants, all from Armani Exchange. <laughs> and I remember like going into this club. I did not know phone parties were a thing there. I had been to them before because I'd been to phone parties like in Sydney before. By the way, those phone parties were usually in a pool where I was in a Speedo and that was appropriate. This phone party was in an urban club outside the patio where everyone has been sweating for several hours. So with no pool nor a shower in sight. So I go in there and I'm also dressed in all white because I'm an idiot. And so I go in... And my friends are like, oh, let's go to the pool. So let's go to the phone party. I'm like, oh, fun. And here I am thinking it's going to be like New Year's Eve where it's just going to be like champagne bubbles, like a bubble machine, you know, like when they should. And it's going to be like a balloon drop. It's just going to be like a drop of like gently non-corrosive bubbles, <laughs> like, you know, that would like caress my skin and leave my clothes intact. I was so fucking wrong. I go in there and I dive in and I'm like, oh, oh, it's sudsy. Okay. So I'm like, oh, this is not too bad. And then I go in and the first thing that happens is I, I first of all, I, at this, when you go in, it's a wall. First thing, what people should realize, the visual is, is at this point, it is a wall. It is a fog. It is not like it's coming up to your knees. It is coming up to your eyeballs. And I am a short Asian person, which means like if it's tall for a tall white person, I am basically like in a glacier at this point. And I distinctly remember like running in after my friends. So my friends just dove in and I'm like, fuck, I got to go find them and because they're my right home. And so I got to go, go in. And the first thing I do is I land face into someone's chest, into a gigantic bear's hairy chest. I fall backwards onto the floor <laughs> in the middle of a foam party with a foam above me. So I am literally now practically like on my back. <laughs> Everything is soaked. The nice, kind, big muscle bear, of course, like brings me... <laughs> hugs me because he's rolling. <laughs> yes. And so that's my first moment is basically face planting into a big muscular chest, being like thrown to the ground, finding myself up, and then eventually seeing my friends, finding my friends and, and having a time of my life. I lost my shirt. I absolutely lost my shirt. I absolutely, at some point, my friend just like, just take this fucking thing off. So I took it off and then I, I, had, I put it in my back of my, of my thing. Oh. But then of course it's foam. So it's everything slippery. So that slipped out. Um, so I mourned the loss of that. Oh, my no. shoes were ruined. Oh. My shorts were like, I could not ever recover that like to the life of me. And on top of that, my phone, which was in my pocket, which if you think phones today like are barely like able to escape like a brush with water back then, no. <laughs> like, so by the end of that evening, while I had an amazing time, I totally snogged a couple of really cute boys. I may have like a couple of handsies around there. I mean, like it's the phone. Like, so you can do, it's like having a dark room, but, but slimier. Like you can do things in there. It's kind of hot. And I will say like foam after a while has this consistency of lubish. It's kind of luby. <laughs> so this other thing too, so what's happening in the foam is things are happening in the foam. Things are happening in that muck. Um, it's not innocent, you know, it's not a bubble bath. It's kind of a, not a bubble orgy, but it's like, it's, it's things are happening there. Okay. So, so what I think you're saying here is that phone parties are good for hand jobs, but not much else. <laughs> they're good for, they're good for when you are wearing nothing but a speedo and maybe some like sandals <laughs> and yeah. a waterproof case. <laughs> around all of your valuables. Yeah. So anyone, if you're, if you're listening and you're thinking of going to a phone party, just prepare yourself these in mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm not selling it to you, <laughs> but I think you should absolutely experience yet another phone party because I will say this, there's nothing quite like the lights. Like, okay, imagine like the lights in a club, right? Imagine the lights like out of like, like the lasers in, you know, the classic mirror ball. And that refracted through the foam in a darkened sort of area, plus the sound of the music making its way through the foam. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's magical. I'm not going to go that far, but it's certainly memorable. <laughs> and it's different. 
Yeah. Um, so what else happened at Velvet Nation? I will say that, um, so probably one of the most significant memories I will ever have um, of a Velvet Nation was either the weekend immediately after or shortly after 9-11. And I know we're about to come to the 20th anniversary of 9-11. I do want to mention this very short because for me, this was a very, uh, very formative moment, not only for me, but for, I think for the community. And at least for me, it solidified really how this community, how the queer community can come together, Right. Um, I was working on Capitol Hill at the time, and I distinctly remember that morning I was just um, on IRC or ICQ, one of those like eons old, like, I think I may have an AOL chat. I was AOL chatting with my best mate in New York, and I remember like at some point around nine o'clock in the morning, suddenly his chat stopped, and I thought, oh, okay, he must have been busy. And then I tried calling another friend of mine, and I was like, hey, are we still on, you know, for this thing that was kind of happened later that month? And they, they stopped answering the text messages. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, my boss comes into my office and says, come to the, living, come to the uh, conference room right now. And I see, you know, everyone's packed in there. I see the giant TV screens. And then, of course, I see it. I see the plane hit. I see all of that. And we were just like aghast. We're mourning, whatnot. Immediately as that was happening, we get the message, as every person in Washington, D.C. at the time got the message, that another plane was heading to the Pentagon. And then... Shortly after that, that happened. And then suddenly everyone's in a panic. Everyone's trying to go home. And then we hear that a, a third plane, or there was another plane. It was the plane that would eventually, you know, be grounded that, you know, they, they were able to ground mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, was headed to the Capitol, literally where I was working at the time. So you can imagine the panic. Shit. You can imagine sort of like the chaos. Everyone was trying to get out of the city. Everyone was trying to escape. I distinctly remember coming out of our office, going to my car to try to pick up my roommate um, who, was, uh, who was working nearby. And uh, I could see across the Pennsylvania Avenue, I, I could see across the street, all of these armored cars loading up all of these senators and their staff into these armored cars to get them to safety. Um, and then I started seeing tanks all across the street. Basically, this, it became just a moment where the city was just like in chaos, but also trying to control the chaos. Um, I eventually, uh, you know, found my car, uh, you know, got into my car, somehow navigated around the city. And then I will never forget at this. Oh, I couldn't find my, my, my roommate, unfortunately, got blocked. All the streets were getting blocked and she had to figure out her own way back. But I do remember saying, okay, we'll meet you back, you know, in our apartment. And our apartment at the time was in the northern part of Virginia, not too far from the Pentagon. And I mentioned that because I had found my way through meandering through the streets, eventually getting out onto the highway, and they hadn't closed it off. I was probably one of the last cars to be allowed on that highway because then I remember driving past the wreckage of the Pentagon. And I distinctly think to myself, I have a camera in the back. Should I stop and take a photo? This seems like, an, like a really, really like important moment that I want to capture. But then my fear overtook me mm -hmm. <clears throat> because then I started hearing sirens. I saw, I mean, like I saw the, the, I saw the fire. I saw that I saw like everything that I could figure out, um, you know, was, was happening in front of me. And it was, and I, all I could think about was like, I need to get the, I need to get out of here. I need to get to safety. I need to get home as quickly as possible. So I went straight home. And uh, eventually my roommate, um, you know, shows up. Um, the phone lines were also in chaos. Nothing was going through. So there was also a, almost a communications blackout. Everyone had to rely on the news. And so I couldn't get a hold. My, my parents were panicking, couldn't get a hold of me. I, I couldn't get a hold of my friends, one of whom I knew for a fact in the, worked in the trade center. Um, and I couldn't get a hold of him. Um, and so, and I had friends in the Pentagon who I couldn't get a hold of when you also worked there. And so there was, there was just a lot of chaos and, um, you know, after, you know, everything started to sort of like, not settle down, but, you know, things started like sort of like happen you know, in the next couple of days. Um, you know, it was, it was, there was a lot of chaos, a lot of misinformation. Um, I distinctly remember a feeling of not calm, but almost just like a pause. It's like the entire city, the entire world was sort of, sort of just taking a breath mm -hmm. and just waiting for something else to happen. Um, and then I distinctly also remember like being invited, like there was a lot of people alone in their apartments um, and there was this feeling that we couldn't leave, but then that switched very, very quickly to, oh no, we have to come together. And I distinctly remember a lot of party, just not, not parties, I would not call them parties, but gatherings, gatherings nearby where people just felt like they needed to be with their, their loved ones, with their chosen family. They needed to be with each other. And then eventually, you know, we started hearing that some spaces were opening up because like the city at that point basically shut down. No, nothing was going to be open you know, because people didn't know if we were going to become under attack. 
Um, and then we decided to um, sort of just, you know, go to people's homes. And then we started hearing from here and there that some venues were starting to open up just so that people had a place to congregate, mm. um, so that they had a place to go. And then shortly after that, um, you know, the, some of the clubs were opening and then some of the venues were starting to open. And I remember at some point Velvet Nation um, decided to open. Um, and there was this general feeling about like whether or not it was appropriate to go. Like, it should we go? Can we go? Like, is it safe? Is it safe to go? Like, who's to say that that's not going to be attacked, you know, by someone nefarious? Like, what are we going to do? But then I remember a drag queen friend of mine, um, you know, who, like many, many people in the entertainment industry, like many queer people in D.C., they have double lives. Like, not only was she a drag queen, she was also an FBI agent <laughs> and worked basically as in security and, uh, and knew a lot of the people who were the first responders. And what she said was, ah, we have to... We have to acknowledge our fear, but I think we also have to retaliate in some way. And there was this phrase of like, we can't let them win. We can't let the terrorists win. And it's almost feeling that the best way to retaliate was to revel in our joy, to mm -hmm. rediscover it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to somehow use joy and togetherness to grieve and using maybe it's not necessarily joy, but sort of like that moment of just like just coming together and just being together as human beings and to come together and, and just be with one another and to maybe, maybe not find joy, but maybe find some sort of solace and peace and just the fact that we were now together and then use, you know, things like music and dance and any sort of art that we could grab onto as a way to maybe not make sense of what had happened, but to make sense of how we were feeling you know, the fear that we were feeling, or maybe to distract just momentarily from the fear that everyone at the time was feeling. Um, and so I do remember like shortly afterwards, you know, going to Velvet Nation and it wasn't necessarily packed. I will say that it wasn't necessarily too packed, but I do remember there was enough people there that it did feel like people were coming together. I had, it was the first time I had seen people since before the attack. It was the first time that people were coming out of their homes. Um, the music was not celebratory, right? But it was almost defiant. Um, it was, you know, it definitely people, it, there was no phone party, but there were definitely drinks. I probably drank more that night than I had ever prior. And then I distinctly remembered that after that, right? Every single weekend after that, um, every single month after that, and especially in those first couple of months, um, where if you remember in DC afterwards, we had the anthrax scare, mm -hmm. where basically somebody had shipped some mysterious powder um, that found out later to be anthrax. I was actually in that. I, I, I was exposed to it and I actually was on sea for many, many, many months. And then like eight months later, we had a sniper. We had a sniper attacks basically where people were randomly getting shot all across the DC area. And so in the midst of all this fear, you just started to see a lot of these club promoters and all these entertainers not retreat, but retaliate, you know, with this want of like saying, no, you're not going to take away our joy. You're not going to take away our celebration. You're not going to replace our revelry, right, um, with fear. And so I loved that. I, I loved how there was always a counterpoint. There was a balance to that rhetoric. Because of course, around all those attacks, there was a lot of rhetoric around fear, around attack, around mistrust, around suspicion. And I felt like places like Nation and queer spaces in particular were the places where one could rally around a different kind of emotion to balance that, that didn't feel so, so fearful, but instead felt more communal mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and, and dare I say even safe. Um, and I saw that. I definitely saw that in the art. I saw that in the music. I saw that in the parties. You know, there, there was just joy, a lot of moments where people were literally, like I said, retaliating with joy. And I found that to be so urgent and the community also was very creative at that point as well. And for me, that was for me, I think what really stuck with me about what was so important about queer spaces and why they needed to be supported and protected was because for a lot of us and for many of us since and for many other instances and moments in history since, those were places where you could not only find that safety, but that permission to find joy again. Do you have any memories from Velvet Nation or from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, please get in touch. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories. Go to lostspacespodcast.com, find the section, share a lost space, and tell me what you got up to. I want to hear all of the juicy details, believe me. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Lost Spaces Pod. 
Find out more about Michael by following him on Instagram. Handily, his handle is Michael Dumlau. And make sure to check out his new book, The Wisdom of Gunkles, and I will share a link to buy the book in the show notes for this episode. Lost Bases is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I have been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there, and will be releasing songs over the coming year. You can hear the first single, Well Groom Boys, which is also playing underneath my talking right now on all good streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribe, leave a review on your podcast platform of choice, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces.